As SpaceX pushes forward with stacking of the first Block 2 Starship, chopstick testing, and office building construction, work on the new launch tower is brought to a halt when the Saren's crane has an unexpected failure. Fortunately, in typical fashion for SpaceX, the issue was resolved quickly and operations resumed with minimal delay. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off this week, in the early hours of Friday morning, Ship 30 was rolled out of the Massey outpost and onto Highway 4. Following a spin prime test the day before that, the Flight 5 Starship was transported back to the build site. Once there, the vehicle was taken directly into Mega Bay 2. A couple of hours later, Ship 30 was connected to one of the building's bridge cranes using a two-point lifter. It was then lifted off of the static fire stand, which was then rolled out from under it and into the ring yard. A transport stand was then positioned under the starship, and the rocket was slowly set down onto it. The installation of the new steel between the star factory and the office building continued this week. Given the layout of these beams and columns, it's clear that this new addition will not be an extension of the nose cone hall, but it remains to be seen exactly how it will be used. With Ship 30 now on a transport stand, it was time for the next rollout. The static fire stand departed the ring yard, followed closely by the Flight 5 Starship. Both articles made their way quickly over to the Sanchez site, where Ship 30 was again parked across from the rocket garden, where the engine installation stand used to be. The stand was then parked in the now mostly empty tower module staging area. Down at the launch site, the Saren's crane was in the process of raising back up following its reconfiguration. Unfortunately, it appears that an extra pendant may have been left in on the main boom. This left excessive slack in the backstay pendants, which resulted in the jib mass falling forward, breaking the hydraulic dampers between it and the main boom, and bringing the process to an abrupt halt. Late that afternoon, the chopsticks underwent a fresh round of testing. First, the alignment sled on the port side chopstick was extended all the way out. Then, the starboard arm followed suit. Also on Friday, Ship 30, which has been parked across from the rocket garden, where the old ship engine install stand used to be, gave us a wave as its flaps were opened. Overnight Friday into Saturday, workers began installing a new type of bumper pad onto the port side chopstick. This new pad appears to be a thick rubber block as before, but now enclosed in a crushable steel box. Not all the installations went smoothly though, with one being lifted back out. The construction crews over at the office building didn't take the weekend off. The glass crews finished the windows on the east wall of the building, while the steel workers pushed forward on the structure between the office and the star factory buildings. That afternoon, following a host of inspections, the Saren's crane was lowered back to the ground for repairs. With the crane down, crews were able to remove the damaged hydraulic dampers. On Sunday, the chopsticks began to swing in small increments. Over the course of a few hours, the arms were swung back and forth. This was their first such movement since the recent upgrades in preparation for a possible catch attempt. Later, the two landing rails were raised to the catch position. These rails, when raised, are supported by multiple gas springs. When the booster comes in for a landing and touches down on the raised rails, the gas springs will help bleed off any remaining momentum before the rocket comes to a hard stop on the arms. On Monday morning, a crane was seen lifting four new gusset plates into Launch Tower 1. The steel plates were installed over some of the steel connections on one of the launch mount facing sides of the tower as reinforcements, possibly in preparation for an upcoming catch attempt. Around that same time, a replacement hydraulic damper for the Saren's crane was spotted being delivered to the launch site. After taking some time off on Sunday, steel crews were back to work on the office to star factory connector Monday. Additional columns and beams were installed as the structure grows closer to the office. Working quickly, the crew was seen installing the new hydraulic damper between the lower jib mast and the main boom. Given that the damage to the other dampers happened Friday, it's evident that the Sarens moved quickly to get the replacement parts shipped to Starbase. That afternoon, the Sarens crane once again began the slow process of being raised back up. 
Apparently, although two dampers were removed, the crane in its current configuration can be raised with only one installed. Once the crane was raised enough for the jib to be free of the dolly, the Saren's crew got right to work on the hooks. Before raising the crane the rest of the way, workers needed to reeve winch cables through both the main and auxiliary blocks. Over at Launch Tower 1, SpaceX continued to put the chopsticks through the paces as they worked towards a fresh round of simulated catch testing with the B-14.1 test article. Also on Monday, the window crews were back at work on the office building. Throughout the day, workers installed roughly half of the remaining windows on the final side of the third level of the facade. That evening, once the reeving work was completed, the Saren's crane was finally raised back into the Texas sky. In this new configuration, the crane will be able to stack the three remaining modules for Tower 2. At midnight, looking to start making up time after the crane issues over the weekend, module number 7 was rolled out of the Sanchez site and onto Highway 4. The next section of the new launch tower was then transported to the launch site and parked just inside the gate to await installation. Later, as the sun rose over Starbase, a concrete pump truck was spotted working near the new D2 gate at the launch site. Over at the new orbital pad, crews continued installing two types of piles. To the left of the tower, workers continued to drill holes and fill them with concrete and rebar to support the foundation for additional ground support equipment. On the other side of the tower, sheet piles were being driven into the soil as part of the process for construction of the new flame trench. Another day at Starbase meant more progress at the office site as crews continue to push forward with both the new building and the connector to the Star Factory. Early that afternoon, a ship lifting squid was taken into Mega Bay 2 and hooked up to one of the building's bridge cranes. This was a bit of a surprise as the two-point lifters have all but made these squids obsolete, with only ship 26 and 32 still having compatible lifting points on the noses. A few hours later, ship 26 was spotted moving in the rocket garden. The ship made the quick trip between the Mega Bays before turning into Mega Bay 2. Later that evening, the ship was connected to the lifting squid and lifted off of its transport stand. The flapless starship was then transferred to the center work stand in the back of the bay. Overnight, one by one, the three vacuum raptors were removed from the rocket. After being removed, the engines were taken in the direction of the raptor's nest at the back of Mega Bay 1. While the third and final one was moving, the transport cart broke down in the ring yard and the move was finished with the help of a telehandler. That afternoon, Ship 26's three gimbling sea level raptors were also removed from the outdated vehicle. Like the vacuum engines before them, they were taken from Mega Bay 2 towards the raptor's nest. That night, with the raptor removal process complete, Ship 26 was lifted back off of the work stand and returned to its transport stand. As the calendar flipped over to Thursday, the second to last module of the new launch tower rolled out of the Sanchez site and down to the pad. With the crane having been hooked up to the seventh module earlier Wednesday, it appears that crews are trying to make up for lost time due to the crane issue. Back at the build site, another SPMT-assisted move was underway as Ship 26, now without engines, was brought back out of Mega Bay 2 and returned to the rocket garden. As the concrete pour continued, the next section of Ship 33's liquid oxygen tank emerged from the Star Factory building. The article was taken directly into Mega Bay 2 to await stacking. Shortly after dawn, the Saren's crane lifted Module 7 off the assembly jig. The module was then lifted up, rotated over, and finally slowly lowered onto the top of the previous module. Once it touched down, crews quickly got to work securing it in place. Less than five hours after the lift started, the load spreader was detached from the tower and lowered back to the ground. Back at the build site, the already stacked upper portion of Ship 33 was moved over to the newly arrived liquid oxygen tank section. Then, after some quick connection work, the pair was tandem lifted over to the turntable for stacking and welding. Over at the office site, the window crew continued to push forward. By the end of the day, a large chunk of the windows for the first wall of the fourth floor had been installed. Starting Wednesday evening and throughout the entire day Thursday, SpaceX stepped up their testing of the chopsticks. 
Mechazilla's arms were put through several rounds of testing, including simulated catching in the air above the test tank, as well as a small amount of swinging around B-14.1. These tests made it apparent why SpaceX has shortened the arms for the future towers, as the inertia from these movements causes a lot of extra swaying after the actuators stop. By Thursday evening, the testing moved into the next phase. SpaceX began more aggressive testing around B-14.1, followed by a simulated catch. With the landing rails extended, the arms closed and raised so the rails engaged the test article's lifting points and compressed down to the tops of the arms. Switching over to Florida, on Friday morning, the new Glenn Pathfinder was laid back horizontally, utilizing the breakover fixture as intended for the first time. About two hours later, over at Historic Launch Complex 39A, the launch of the Starlink Group 10-7 mission was aborted during the last minute of the count. Less than 24 hours later, however, Falcon 9 Booster 1073 successfully launched that mission, delivering a batch of 23 more Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. Just a short time later, Bob steamed into Port Canaveral loaded with both of the recovered fairing halves from Saturday morning's Starlink launch. On Tuesday morning, SpaceX was seen performing tests and inspections of the crew access arm at Launch Complex 39A. These tests were in preparation for the Polaris Dawn mission, currently scheduled for launch on the 26th of this month. Meanwhile, over at the port, Just Read the Instructions was towed back to the SpaceX dock carrying Booster 1067 from its 21st mission. Just a few hours later, the Falcon 9 first stage was lifted off the deck of the drone ship and transferred to the dockside stand for processing. Wednesday morning, Booster 1067 had completed its dockside processing and was transferred to an awaiting transporter for its return to SpaceX's refurbishment facilities. Just hours later, the chartered fairing recovery vessel Go Cosmos returned to Port Canaveral with the fairing halves from Monday's Starlink launch. And that afternoon, a short fall of Gravitas was towed into port with Booster 1073 from that same mission. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.